uh, semi-qualitative, you could view it either way, insights that we can get within, um, from causal loop diagrams. Instead, instead looking at them from a, um, uh, from a quantitative standpoint, and that required us to introduce um, the basic building blocks of quantitative models and system dynamics, which are stocks on the one hand and flows on the other. Um, we further looked at, at the ways in which um, there are feedbacks captured within those models, uh, particularly negative feedbacks associated with something called a first order delay. And I'm going to go and, um, and uh, take a look at a model uh, uh, of that sort with you and make sure that uh, we recall some aspects of its uh, dynamics. So um, here we were talking about um, uh, delays and we talked about this principle that structure shapes behavior. Can anyone remind me what the, the meaning of this, this kind of slogan is? What are we talking about when we speak about structure and what sort of behavior are we talking about? I introduced that last time in the lecture, but I went over it somewhat quickly. Anyone? Well, when we're speaking about the structure of a quantitative simulation model in a system dynamics context, and we're going to quite soon within the course, um, another uh, week and a half probably, we're going to talk about it in an agent-based context. But here we're talking about a situation where system structure is defined by the, um, uh, the underlying uh, relationships between variables in the model. And the variables here are predominantly stocks and flows, um, connections between them. There's a set of other variables that are we call auxiliaries, constants, but those are really just names for combinations of these more basic say the sum of these three stocks, we give it a convenience name. And from a mathematical perspective, it's really stocks and flows where the action's at. Um, so we have a notion of, of system structures defined the, by the variables and the relationships to one another, the, the mathematics of that relationship. And the mathematics here are dictated by ordinary differential equations. Stocks correspond to state variables within these ordinary differential equations. In other words, the things on the left-hand side whose derivatives are, are defined on the right-hand side. So instead of saying, how does this stock behave over time as putting that into the model, presupposing it, instead that emerges from the model. It emerges because we just describe how the derivative of that stock, the change in that stock, the net flow into that stock depends on other variables within our model. So you might have said like dx dt equals some function of x, y, and z. Um, and this, this may dictate over time as x evolves, as y evolves, and as z evolves a, a behavior that has some structure to it behavior that has some regularities to it. But we didn't presuppose this. We didn't put it in, impose it upon the model. That behavior over time emerges from the sort of step-by-step -step integration of this model over time as we see how x, y, and z evolve. And in general, for nonlinear models, the behavior of the whole, we say, is greater than the sum of the behavior of the parts. You can't take the model apart into easy to easy to sort of analyze pieces and figure out how the behavior emerges from that by simply summing up the behaviors of those small pieces. You're not able to do that with a nonlinear system. It it's going to be resistant to that kind of decomposition into pieces and summing it up for most general nonlinear systems. So instead, what we have to do is integrate it out over time in a numerical way. We have to simulate it step by step by step by step. Turns out linear systems are amenable to composition. Anyone in here? Is anyone here from um, engineering background? Has anyone had uh, systems theory? OK. So you'll have encountered before, um, for example, um, for LTI systems, linear time invariant systems, um, 
systems with resistors, capacitors, inductors, uh, etc. You can you can analyze how they behave with respect to sine waves of different frequencies. And by understanding how it behaves with respect to each of those, you can then decompose a signal into those sine waves. And we call that decomposition, uh, performing a, a spectral decomposition of Fourier transform of the, of the inputs. And by figuring out how it responds to each frequency, we can kind of figure out how it responds to an arbitrary signal. Well, with nonlinear systems, we can't do that. They're resistant to that sort of analysis. They, they're not amenable to the taking it apart, figuring out how each of those parts behaves and summing it all up. We have to deal with more in a more holistic way with the, with the system, okay? Um, and broadly we say with these systems that the structure shapes the behavior in important ways. If you change the structure of the model, say ladies and gentlemen, by adding a feedback, or by adding a stock, or by adding a flow to a stock, it will change that behavior potentially in a very significant way over time. We saw that in the first day of class when we added a feedback. What was the feedback we added or deleted? And it led to markedly different behavior. I'll give you a hint. It wasn't me showing this. It was someone else, a volunteer. Yeah, it was, remember this balancing of this, of this yardstick on your finger? So, it made a world of difference whether or not there's a feedback in place. What feedback was that? Sorry? Yeah, the visual feedback associated with, with balancing the yardstick. Um, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking ad lib here. There's no slides yet. Okay, um, thanks. Um, so, uh, so it was with the yardstick. Um, we, it, it was, oh, excuse me, there are slides. Oh, gosh. Um, what am I saying? I'm, I'm not that ad lib. Um, so, uh, pardon me for just a second here. Um, okay, uh, can you folks see the slides now? Can you see the slides on the screen? Um, so we added, and we changed the feedback. So cutting that visual response, we were able to, oh, nope, nope, okay. Um, I'll, I'll keep on uh, working with these slides. Um, so we'll, we'll try this again. Uh, so um, what we did is we, we eliminated that visual feedback and then that made the system very unstable. It was unable to be easily balanced um, on the finger. When we allowed that sort of feedback, in other words, when we allowed the, um, the visual cueing in to the, um, to the state of the yardstick, it allowed it to be balanced. So in short, we had a negative feedback, a balancing feedback that was involved. If you could see it, you could move your hand to keep it in balance, right? It kept it stable. We've noted that these balancing feedbacks keep things stable. Um, when we eliminated that feedback, it made it unstable. Um, and indeed, um, uh, when, we, when we closed the person's eyes, it was a terribly unstable system. It simply fell over. The yardstick fell over. So that's an example of how changing the structure of the system, whether or not there's a feedback, makes a huge difference to the qualitative behavior, not merely quantitative, not merely a matter of degree, but qualitative behavior of the system. Um, so we say that stock and flow structure, including feedbacks, determine the qualitative behavior modes that the system can take on. Whether or not the system can exhibit oscillations, whether or not it's unstable or stable, whether or not it is resistant to perturbation, uh, a sign of, of certain types of stability. That's an aspect of its underlying structure. And ladies and gentlemen, this leads to a, a philosophical perspective when it comes to system dynamics, that to explain the behavior of a system over time, while outside factors may be important in, in uh, triggering things, Fundamentally, it's the structure of the system that leads to vulnerability to those outside factors. Okay. So in other words, um, the, the more interesting question is not what's going on outside the system, but why it's vulnerable to certain types of shocks, certain types of disturbances, and not others. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is an aspect of the structure of the system. It's an aspect of the internal feedbacks. And this gives us hope, in a way, because when we see a company in dysfunction, 
or when we see a public health system that's not living up to our hopes, or when we see a um, you know, uh, congestion within a city. Fundamentally, it points back to what we can do in terms of adding information feedbacks, adding material feedbacks, um, adding uh, new types of, of structures by which one part of the system might interact with another in a way that would lessen the vulnerabilities to outside shocks. So that outside shocks that would have you know, blown the system over before, maybe it's an outside competitor, instead allow it to, to um, rise in a, in a uh, stronger way to a greater position of strength. So, so from within the system dynamics community, there's look to the structure of the system as the defining element that allows a system to thrive or, or that makes it vulnerable to certain types of failure. And often there's a conscious articulation of how do we change the structure of the system say by adding a feedback uh, involving new information fed back for faster decision making. So with West Nile, for example, if we could speed up the, uh, the acquisition of information by decision makers so that they could more quickly know about mosquito populations, know about infection levels in those mosquito populations, that the availability of that feedback in a timely fashion might allow for much more effective decision making which might really lower the burden of West Nile in, 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 uh, within the system. In a model that Dylan worked on uh, during the boot camp this summer, a, an appreciation for the delays associated with um, drug action on the, on the body might allow for much more effective control when it comes to management of anemia. Going from a situation where it's very um, uh, it, it, it's sort of sloppy and ad hoc to a situation where one could with confidence control a, a, a patient's evolution over time and know that they'll be in a stable state instead of a wildly oscillating state. So understanding the structure of the system is seen as a key enabler from a system dynamics perspective for more intelligent management of that system. And the system and system the structure and system dynamics is captured by stocks and flows in the connections between them, the feedbacks that, that are involved in them. Okay, any question on the general principle before we, we dive into some specifics? Um, yes? This just has to go back to using MC. Yeah. Um, more of a technical issue. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, stocks and flows and density. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so I think what you're asking about is, um, so there's a question um, from a participant about uh, use of Vensim, and, and uh, as I understood the question, um, it was focused on the issue of, of what do you need to specify to the model, right? Um, so uh, if I call up Vensim, what is it that I need to give Vensim to make it happy so that it can do its job for me? Is that... Yes. Is that a sort of a, a crude way to put the question? Yeah, that's pretty much exactly. Okay. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do for for the remote participants, I am going to um, just switch over so they can see my Vensim window here, and uh, I apologize for the delay here, but um, here's Vensim, and I know this is a slightly different version than you folks have, but um, here stands before me. Uh, a, a Vensum campus and uh, we had drawn up some stocks and flows last time and um, I'm just going to to draw up you know here's a, a, a population right and um, we might have um, I, in fact even before I do this let me let me just start with a causal loop diagram okay so we might have a population here and um, Populations might be driven by um, births and deaths, and so we might have births, right? And then we might have deaths over here. And uh, what are the what are the feedbacks? What are the relevant connections here? Anyone want to 
fill this out. Well, we might have something like this. Uh, right. Um, so what are the polarities associated with these loops? Sorry? Yeah, so this is, this is a positive polarity um, associated with this loop. Okay, so, so why isn't this calling up? Pardon me for just a second here. Um, this is uh, uh, exhibiting abnormal behavior. Let's just see if it comes up for, for, for this. Okay, so, so that's, uh, that's working. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, so I just right-clicked on it. Um, so we'd have something like this, right-click on this arrow. We'd have something like uh, this. And then for deaths, what do we got? So this is what sort of loop here? This is a good chance for review. I'm gonna put a comment in here. What sort of loop is this? Positive, yes, and this is going to be uh, clockwise, boom, right? Um, so there's a positive feedback. How about this other guy? What's it, what sort of feedback is this associated with? Okay, uh, so if we have a higher population, all the things being equal, we will have more or less deaths. Yeah, uh, more deaths. For those who are not here for this portion of the course, you should you should go check out my slides that are online and indeed uh, the videos if you uh, if that would help. And this is a negative. Why is that a negative? The lower the population, all the things being equal. That's right. Okay. Yes. Uh, as far as the sides of the arrows, um, there's no strict convention. I prefer putting them at the uh, at the uh, middle of the so-called handle of this, which is the little kind of um, uh, the little thing you see uh, here. Um, the reason I like doing that is because sometimes when you have many things coming in, let's suppose if you have two arrows coming in, it visually it's not clear which is plus, which, with which arrow each successive polarity is associated. Um, yeah, it might be better to have them inside to avoid interfering with other loops, but but there's no strict convention for that. Okay, so so this is a this is a is this a model, folks? Is that a model? Is is what's on the screen a model? Riddle me that. Sorry. Okay. Okay. It, you think it is a model? Or it's not a model. Okay, there's no stocks and flows. I would argue this is still a model. Yeah, it's still a simplified sort of representation of the external world that that captures some of its important aspects, in particular causal connections between a bunch of different factors. Um, in a way that, that helps us think about that world and, and sort of reason about its behavior. Its behavior, in fact, over time, because these loops are each associated with characteristic behaviors. This loop with instability, this loop with stability. This loop with trying to pull towards some goal, this loop with divergent behavior. So is that a model? Yeah, it's a model. Is it a simulation model? Now, maybe that's what was getting. That is not a simulation model. I could go try to run this thing and Benson will be one unhappy camper. It looks perfectly happy now. It looks picture perfect. But if I try to run it, it says errors. And I don't know if this is what you're running into. No, okay. So now let's go. So, so this is a, um, you know, uh, simple, simple <laughs> causal loop diagram. Um, okay, now let, let's go, how would I put this thing into a, a stock and flow model? This is a good chance to review, particularly for those who have, for whom this is a chance to view. There's no we in the, in the viewing. Um, so, so how would I turn this into a stock and flow model? Okay, stock is population, and what are the other two things? They're flows. Good. So, so bursts we might represent as a flow into the stock, right? Bursts. How do we know their flows? Yeah, wait. If, if, if I told you, or a big place, Saskatoon has 10 bursts, what would you say? Yeah, you say for 
year, week, or day for a millisecond. Um, <laughs> it'd be important to think about the unit of time. Because we're, we're talking about a rate change over time. Population, by contrast, you don't need to talk about it, have a particular way of measuring time to state what the population is now. I don't care whether you measure time in years or or seconds or nanoseconds, femtoseconds, picoseconds. The population now it's the same. It doesn't care about the time. It's it's it, it has no time unit in its dimension. Person. Um so so that's a stock, okay. That's something we can measure at a given point in time you freeze time as well. Okay, so that's good. Now, is this model simulatable yet? So, so this is a stock and flow model. Is this, is this a model? Is that a model? Yeah. It's kind of abstract representation that abstracts away a lot of details, a lot of details, but it captures some important aspects of, of the situation, relationships among a couple factors. Is it an exhaustive model? No. Is it a perfect model? No. All models are wrong, it's sometimes said, but some are useful. All simplify, abstract away from certain details. I never used this example before, but it's an important one to think about. How many people here have used a map before? Okay. Is that map? So so if you looked at a map of Saskatoon, you're, you're going to drive the streets, you've got to go over and find Cynthia Street. Um, and you were to look at that map. Is that map wrong? Because it omits a tree that you see on the right? Or a telephone pole? It omits where the sewer gratings are? Is that a wrong map? question here is purpose. What purpose are you using? Would a street map be useful to go over to, to Cynthia Street? Yeah, that would be useful. Um, now, if you were trying to plan flooding control measures within Saskatoon and so on, would you use a street map as your primary tool? Probably not. You'd probably use a topographic map, some map that captured sort of slopes and so on. But we don't you know, we don't have the impulse to say, okay, this map is wrong because it omits all the details. And we have to think of, of models in a similar way. They're abstractions just like a map is. And we look to different maps for different types of purposes. If we were interested in fixing brownout problems in the city, um, we might look to an electrical connectivity grid map of the city. If we wanted to fix flooding, we'd look to a hydrological map. If we wanted to, to deal with um, navigating our car, we might look to a street map, etc. These are all different maps for different purposes. They're all abstractions. They abstract away from different things. And in fact, the only perfect map of the world is the world itself. And that's not a very useful map, because we can't carry it in our car. We can't easily use that. We want simplified representations that abstract away. And so it is with models. Uh, one of the first impulses people have, particularly when it comes to agent-based modeling, where we're going to be spending the bulk of the course's time, is they want to put everything into the model. Because you can do it. But, but technologically, the constraints are less and less binding. It's harder within these sorts of models to grow it too big. It gets really cumbersome, it turns out. And I get many models to show that. But within a, an agent based context, you could throw everything, including the kitchen sink, in there, but it's not going to do you much good. It, it, and it's going to be just as cumbersome as cluttering your map of streets of Saskatoon with every little pebble and every description of where the, the overhead power lines are, etc. It's not going to serve, serve a purpose. So you've got to keep in mind the model purpose. Okay, is this a model? Yeah, it's a model. It's a model. We could argue about how good a model it is. Like maybe birth should be, you know, uh, should be driven by, we should add some lines showing the causal connections between birth and population, et cetera. But, but it's a starting point. Okay, 
So that's a stock and flow diagram. Is that a simulation model? So do you think I can go simulate this? No, did I ask that? It says cannot be simulated. Why not? Why can't I simulate that? Yeah, it doesn't. Okay, so so the guess, this gives us some information on how population is affected by births and some information on how it's affected by deaths and so on. But but it it isn't specific enough to do this simulation over time, right? It isn't specific enough to, to quantitatively tell us the implications of this model. Hmm? Hmm. So so what do we have to put in here? We have to put in, yeah, we have to put in some, some formulas. We have to put in some expressions that describe what depends on what. Now, here's a question. I don't know if this is the best use of time, but this is a very good use of our time. I, I, I kind of like the way this is going, particularly given all the new faces in attendance. This. This, this actually captures some of the most important salient points of the last few lectures. So, so I have to specify more details on this to make it precise. What do I have to specify? Let's be more specific. Okay, we, we need some numbers. Um, what's the one number I definitely need? For, for it to tell me over time how many people are in that population, what's a number I... I need to to give it for sure. How many in there initially? Because after the initial time, what is population shaped by, ladies and gentlemen? What is this population dictated by after the initial time? By the flows. Its evolution is totally dictated by the stocks and flows. But it has to start somewhere. We can't have this somehow magically, you know, have no starting point. It, it has to start somewhere. So we have to give it some initial value for the population. So to do that, we go into this equations mode, which is, has a different icon now, and we'll, we'll put down a value of 1,000. Okay. Okay, now someone said I have to put expression or formulas in. Where do we have to put the formulas? By the way, this is white. This is uh, this is now turned a different color instead of the, the black color here. What? That means it's happy. Benson is happy with this. Do I have to need, do I have to put a formula in there? Is, is there a formula, further formula I have to put in this stock? No. Remember, we're not presupposing, we're not forcing upon this model. Uh, we're not dictating in a functional way, well, how population changes over time. That, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be dictated by the, by the two flows, flow in, flow out. And those two, the net flow is going to be what's on the right-hand side here on the board, which is the derivative of population, okay? Okay, so how do I go about specifying the net flows? How do I go about specifying those flows? What do I do? Well, I have to put, put a little formula here, right? And maybe what Dylan is talking about is, it, maybe it's being an unhappy camper here. I'm not sure. But is, is, is that part of it? Um, I'm sorry, I missed the question. Okay, the question is, um, uh, I'm trying to understand sort of where the model is, is being ornery for you, is complaining for you. Um, is it sort of at this point where it's saying it can't simulate it yet, and so we have to fill in these formulas? Um, that's what I was thinking of the first place. I'm not entirely sure at this point. It's just more Okay, so, so um, I, I will come over and, and uh, take a look at that in just a minute. But, um, okay, so let's put in a formula for births. Um, uh, so this is births, this is people per unit time. And we'll have some birth rate times the population, right? And, uh, oh, population. Um, and, uh, and then we're gonna have a mortality rate. Um, it strikes me that, um, that one of the people in this class could actually give this lecture, <laughs> give this lecture but, um, 
but maybe he won't be too bored by it, uh, hearing it again a um, couple years later. Okay, so uh, here we might have population times mortality rate, right? We could put them in a different order. And then birth rate, maybe we'll have it being 0 0.02, 0 0.02, um, say 2% per year, and mortality rate 0 0.01. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is exhibiting no sort of coloration in these things, and it's a happy camper. And I could run this, and lo and behold, whoa, lo and behold, population will be going up over time from 1,000. Okay, so what did I have to fill in? I needed to fill in a couple things there. I need to fill in the initial value, I need to fill in formulas for this. And I put some supporting things here. Did I need to put these in, birth rate and death rate? Did I need to? Could I have done this without these these things? Yeah, I could have. I could have put, for the formula for births, I could have put, instead of birth rate times population, I, I could have put 0.02 times population. Would that have been better or would have been worse? Dylan's shaking his head, and, and Dylan is correct. Um, so why is that worse? To sort of put it in there. Why is hard coding it worse? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so folks, if you want to go change something, say about the birth rate, now they're scattered throughout your, your code. It's not, you don't have this obvious dependence on this variable that you can track down and know what, what things are depending on it. Here, you just change it one place, everything else uses it. If you start hard coding all sorts of places, you might forget to update some rather than others. Maybe one time it says 0.01. You don't know if that's logically half the birth rate, 0.02 divided by 2, or if it's just a totally different origin of that, totally different provenance. So, so in short, we want to make the dependencies explicit. And by breaking up constants and variables explicitly, we lend ourselves greater flexibility for changing them in the future. Um, the, the structure of the thinking is more transparent, and we have lower risks of, of mistakes. So we just went through a construction process. What part of that was tripping you up? Can you? Um, I did everything similar to there, and for some reason yesterday I was getting errors, but we have wrong today. I don't quite know what I did. Okay. Okay. But thank you again for this. This is very, very instructive. Okay, well, I'm, I, I'm glad uh, you, you found it useful. Um, and hopefully you conferred some value for the new people to the class, but uh, I'd like to get to the root of what was going on there um, because it's, it's unsettling to me and it's probably unsettling to you. Um, okay, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm watching our, our remote folks here. Um, let me just go frob something in case it's, um, oh, um, it, it looks like we have a high, um, look at that, man. Um, what, what is it that's using s burning CPU? Uh, okay, well, it's just the, just the process. So um, I don't think there's anything I'm going to do about that. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the slides here. Um, and we're going to whip through some material um, on, on the basis of that. So uh, I'm going to start sharing once again my slides. And uh, do, 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 um, there we go. Okay, so... Here are the, the slides. So I talked about structured basic behavior. So I'm going to talk about a couple things today with an eye towards finishing up our, our coverage of system dynamics pretty quickly. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about, about three things today. First order delays, high, uh, aging chains, and higher order delays of competing risks. And because of the tyranny of time, we're going to be doing this, um, uh, doing this pretty quick. And I can refer you to the online resources uh, for more details. So we talked last time about first order delays. Um, first order delays, I would be tempted didactically to ask, ask the participants here what a first order delay is, but I've highlighted some of them here. This stock has a first order delay associated with it. We have some outflow, which has a certain time constant associated with it, or a certain chance per unit time of going this direction. We call that a first order delay for reasons we'll see in a few minutes. 
Um, here's another first order delay um, in, a, in a model uh, there. And when we have a situation like this, we, we stylize it to, to look something like this. Here we have some inflow and we have an outflow and this is our first order delay. The distinguishing factor, ladies and gentlemen, of the first order delay is see we have a single stock, a flow out of it that depends linearly on the value of that stock. Um, so here we have a um, annual risk of, of death, of transition downstream here of 0.05. 5 percent chance per year that a given person who's in this stock, X of people, will, will leave that stock via that outflow. And the formula for deaths is, ladies and gentlemen, what? What is the formula for deaths? Maybe I should bend over with that. <laughs> what is the formula for deaths? those two, that's great. <laughs> Either the multiply. So each person has a certain chance going. So if we're considering, if you have a 5% chance per year of dying, and there's 100 people at risk, how many on average die per year? So 100 people at risk, 5% chance per year of dying five on average die per year. So the rate of people dying, people per year, is just 0.05 times the 100. It's just linearly dependent. And that's what defines, ladies and gentlemen, a first order delay. Okay, so what's the behavior of this stock? So if we, if we had this and we had if we have no immigration coming in, no people coming into this stock at all, so suppose we have zero indeed for the immigration rate, what is the what is the um, value of the stock do over time? Okay, it decreases. And in what day, way does it decrease? Does it decrease in a straight line? Does it decrease in a in a wavy figure, does it decrease in a at a decreasing rate, or how does it decrease? Okay, it decreases at a decreasing rate. It looks like something like that. And why is that? Can anyone sum up for me in a nutshell? Why is it that this decreases faster early on and slower later? Yeah, less people at risk down here, right? I mean, after all, um, there's only 250 or so people at risk after about 25 years, and and so it's in terms of people per year dying, it's going to be smaller number, and so it's going to be the year-to-year -year drop in the number of people is going to be smaller. Fewer people dying per year, so it's going to be dropping less quickly per year. Whereas in the first year, a thousand people at risk, you're going to expect another, uh, you know, a lot of time. Okay, what's the mean time until people die? So we have this five percent chance of dying per year. What's the mean time until they die? Mm. Good. Good. Okay, that that's great. That's great. Twenty years. It's exactly right. Where did that number come from? From whence did that number come? And there's a there's a principle called Little's law that uh, provides that relationship. So it's it's 20 years, and note that's dimensionally correct. So this is five percent chance. So it's it, it units are one over a year, and a probability over a year, sort of uh, unit dimension over over a year. And you invert that one over it, and you get years. And so it's 20 years. That's right. And, uh, okay, now suppose we had a constant inflow. So, so here and you have 20 years. Okay, so that's excellent. Um, okay, so suppose we have a constant outflow to this. What's going to, a constant inflow, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? I would argue, I'll give you a hint, ladies and gentlemen. We already have a constant inflow. It's just that the value of that inflow is what? Zero. Hmm. 
So that led to certain behavior. So we have a, well, okay, I'll give you another hint. Ladies and gentlemen, is there a feedback in this model? Where is that feedback? Where is that feedback? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I think at least Riley is remembering. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've done that. Okay, so so I was pointing out where the feedback it's staring me in the eye right now. Um, so so the feedback is like this. So increase number of people, all of the things being equal, will that increase the number of deaths per unit time or decrease it? Compared to what, what the value it would have had, it's going to increase it. Yeah, so if we had zero people at risk, zero people going, if we had a thousand people at risk, we'd have more people dying per, per year. If we had a million people, we had more. So, so if you increase this, all of the things being equal, it's going to increase this compared to the value. It's going to increase deaths compared to the value it otherwise would have had. Now, where's the, how do we complete the loop? Well, Riley is saying it's, it's back like this. If we increase the number of the rate of deaths, deaths per unit ton, does it increase or decrease people compared to the value it otherwise would have held? It's going to decrease it. So there's a negative feedback, but there's a negative link there. And so is there a feedback loop? Yeah, it's a balancing feedback loop. It's a negative feedback loop. It tends to stability. Okay, those are two hints. Tends to disability, and right now we actually have a value, value zero. What stable situation is this going towards right now? What's towards what stable situation is this going right now? No people in that stock. Okay, now with that in mind, suppose we have a constant inflow. What would be the behavior then? Okay, some equilibrium value. What's at equilibrium? So that's correct. What's what's going to be at equilibrium? Okay. Okay. The pieces are starting to come together. So flow in and flow out will lead to what being unchanged. And when we talk about equilibrium, when we talk about a system in balance, we talk about a situation where things aren't changing, um, the, the values of the stocks aren't changing particularly. It's in a stasis values are static in terms of the stock. And when flow in equals flow out, what will be static? What will be unchanged? What will be fixed? What will be invariant? The number of people. The stock. Flow in equals flow out. That's what will lead to stasis, ladies and gentlemen. And if there's a negative feedback loop, it's pulling us towards some sort of stasis. It's trying to stabilize the situation. And the stable situation will be where the stock doesn't change, and that requires flow in to equal flow out. And that gives a description of what the situation will be. So, um, so we can compute the value of the stock that does this. It's just the inflow divided by alpha, um, the, the, the chance per unit time of, of leaving. So, um, so we see something like this. I mean, I will cut to the chase with it. Um, so here, we're starting at 1,000 people. And if we have an inflow of zero, which is what we started with, we get this black line going down to the bottom here. If we have an inflow of, under what conditions will it lead to this red line? Let me, riddle me that. Under what conditions will we see that red line where the stock doesn't change? Under what conditions would the value of the stock not change over time? Under what conditions would it would it um, would it would it stay just constant, never changing from the start, always remaining at a thousand? Under what conditions? Inflow equals outflow. Good. Okay. Um, is it two hundred? Twenty. Good. Good. Thought process is exactly right. And where did that 20 come from? 1,000 times the, 
Yeah, exactly. So, so um, what you was going through in her mind there was that, I'm not mistaken, okay, we're trying to figure out the inflow that leads this to be in balance. And what she figured out cleverly was that there's some rate of people leaving here, right? And that rate, well, we know what the formula is there. It's this thing. We know how many people are there initially, a thousand. So whatever this rate is that keeps this constant, it's got to be such that it's the same rate as at, at that initial time. So a thousand times 0.05, right? 50 people. Yeah. 50. Um, right? 50, 50 people. 50, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's 50. It's 1,000 times 0.05. Yeah. But the thought process is exactly right. I think what was confusing was that sometimes it's divided by a delay here, in, in which case it'll be 100. Oh, yeah. There are two at another time. Okay, yeah. So, um, so if this were a mean time, to, to leave would be divided by it, um, because the, the mean time is just 1 over the, the annual risk. Okay. So, so here would be, it would be 50 people coming in. So it's that 1,000 times 0.05, yep. Yeah. Um, and, um, and this shows the behavior under a variety of different uh, inflows. So if the inflow is less than the outflow starts, what happens to the stock folks? So, so if this inflow is less than 50, 50 is what's needed to maintain it. If it's less than 50, what happens? That inflow is less than 50, what's going to happen? Okay, and so what's going to happen, therefore? So the inflow is less than the outflow, therefore the stock will drop in value, and that will lead to what dropping also? The number of deaths, in other words, the outflow. I thought I was going to have to hang in for a second there. Uh, and that, that will lead to the stock declining until what happens? Until the, well, okay, no population if the inflow is zero, but is this no population here? No. No, it actually reaches a stasis where inflow equals outflow, right? So in other words, if you have 20 people coming in per month, this is gonna go down to a level where the outflow is what? 20. It's going to decline to that, and that's where the stock's going to be stable. Inflow equals outflow, so it's just going to remain there. That's the value of the stock from then on, right? Now, meanwhile, if we had a lot more people coming in, 100 people coming in per unit time, per year, then the value of the stock is going to do what? It's going to increase. It's going to increase slower and slower. Why slower and slower? Because as this why is it increasing? It's increasing because what? This, 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 uh, I'm not going over this for no reason. This is going to be absolutely essential for explaining one of the, the real insights in a few days. Um, one or two more classes. We're going to see something where this, is abs this sort of reasoning is absolutely essential for understanding the behavior. And if you have these intuitions, you'll be able to parse behavior in the world much better than than if you don't. You'll be able to understand why certain phenomena behave the way they do. Because you see it in terms of stocks and flows, inflows and outflows, equilibrium, etc. Okay, so this, so when we have the inflow rate be 100, this is rising. Why is it rising? Why is the value of the stock rising? It's, it, if a value of a stock is rising, it must be because what is, inflow is greater than outflow. Okay, but why is it rising, why is it rising less and less quickly? Because what? You know, there's a negative feedback, and as the value of the stock's going up, what else is happening? The more deaths, so the value of the outflow is going up, and so that net difference is getting closer and closer. So it's going to asymptote. It's going to reach an ultimate value where it's not changing. And at that, if it's not changing anymore, that means that what equals what? Equals, uh, uh, equal inflow equals outflow. So it tends to stability. It doesn't always tend to stability of zero. That's just if there's no inflow. It tends to stability at different levels where always inflow is equal to outflow. 
And ladies and gentlemen here, we don't program this in. This is not in any way programmed in. It's an emergent property of the system. In this case, it's a particularly simple system. It's a linear system. Um, so it's, it, it comes out very directly. But we'll see the same type of reasoning come key to the fore with nonlinear systems in a few days. Okay. Um, okay. So this is, there's a goal seeking behavior. It seeks this goal of, of stasis, stabilizes them. Right? Um, and uh, we, we, we saw this sort of uh, saw this sort of reason. Okay, so we have a we, we have a, a okay, yeah, well that's a good question. So how would the system behave to a sudden change in immigration? Let's suppose, ladies and gentlemen, um, that we had a, a sudden rise um, in the number of immigrants coming in. So suppose we had uh, 20, an inflow of 20, and it was declining like this, and then suppose we had a sudden change, and, and it went up from 20 to, to 50. What would happen? Okay, and how would it rise? I would argue it would look much like the blue line. So if we suddenly at time 50 had an increase from 20, associated with the green line, to 50, what you'd see is a, what sort of rise at first? It would be very, at first actually it's going to be fast because there's a big gap between inflow and outflow. And then it will, it will start approaching this line up here, which is the 50 line. Um, sort of rise up to there, and you folks can do that on your, on your, um, uh, on on your um, systems by if you want it for the immigration rate, you could do an if then else. Time is less than fifty, make it zero. Otherwise, less than, make it twenty or what have you. Um, okay, and and it will sort of look like this. The baseline value might not be zero if, if it had been coming before, and then it will sort of shoot up and and follow that. Okay. So um, here's inflow and outflow. When you have a sudden rise in inflow, the, stop, the, the outflow will follow it like that. Okay, um, here's the value of the stock, okay? Um, yeah, so, so here's a question. Um, so inflow and outflow shown in the same graph. With a sudden rise of inflow, the outflow starts to follow it. How do I had alpha be different things? Let's suppose alpha instead of being 5%. What if it were what if it were 1%? How do you think that would change things? What's the mean time in the stock if alpha is 1%? The mean time is 100 years. Okay. How would that change its behavior over time? that in terms of, of bursts and deaths, um, you, would, you would still this, see this sort of behavior, but it would be faster or slower, like this. So here's a, here's a you know, five year delay, a 10 year delay, 20 year delay, two year delay. The, the smaller the, the delay, the one over the alpha, um, the faster and faster will approach the new equilibrium more responsive it will be, the more immediate its response to that rise in inflow. Let me ask this, in the extreme case where, where alpha approaches zero, and the, the time in that stock, the mean time in that stock approaches infinity, what will be the case then? Suppose it were zero, the extreme case, alpha is zero. The inflow is going to do what? It's going to never change at all, right? It's going to remain down here. And if we make alpha very, very, very small, it's going to it's going to follow this, right? The inflow is going to follow it, but it's going to only creep up slowly because it requires a really large rise, ladies and gentlemen, in that stock to trigger. A very, that stock has to get up to a very high level to bring a tiny, tiny alpha, say 10 to the minus 6, 
times the value of the stock to equal the outflow value, or sorry, the value of the inflow. So to get up to the point where the inflow equals outflow it requires a huge value of the stock for the stock times 10 to the minus 6 to equal the inflow. So the stock would have to go up to a very, very high level, and that takes a while to build up. So it would go up slowly. Eventually it would reach that, but it would go up slowly. And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, we call these different delays, orders of delay, or di different, excuse me, time constants uh, associated with the delay. A two-year time constant, a 20-year time constant. This yields the outflow to follow the inflow with a certain delay, and it's not exactly following it. We'll see in agent-based modeling there's much greater flexibility for specifying the outflow to be a de precisely delayed version of the inflow. You can do it with Venn, but it's kind of clunky. But here, um, here it will follow. It just follows in this kind of smoothed out sort of way. Okay, so we, we, we say that there's a time constant associated with this delay. Um, by the way, these are the values of the stock. So these are, you'll notice that with a 20 year delay, a 0.05 chance per unit time, this takes a long time for the outflow to follow the inflow. What do you think the value of the stock has to do there? It has to get very what? It has to build up to a very high level to make that happen. So it has to go up to a very high level. Meanwhile, a five-year delay has to build up to a smaller level, a two-year delay, a smaller level yet for the inflow to equal the outflow. Okay. So, but if you think about it, in, inflow and outflow, here we're dealing with kind of different speeds of following the change. Okay. Um, by the way, if, if you ever have a chance to spend time in an engineering lab with a capacitor, this is exactly the behavior you see. Um, you see these types of behaviors. Um, a lot. I've enjoyed the, the pleasure of its close acquaintance um, over many occasions, and it's it's very nice to see it physically uh, instantiated. A capacitor is basically a stock that can fill and drain. Um, okay, well, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip that in the interest of time. Okay, so let's uh, use the closing minutes here for a couple extending this. So, first order delays are distinguished by the fact that when people come into those stocks, and I'm going to have to go back a little bit to find this. Let me ask this, folks. Your chance of leaving, given that you're in the stock X, your chance of leaving per unit time, does it change by how long you've been in the stock? If you're in the stock right now, does it change how long you've been there? No. If you're still in here, you've always got this 5% chance per year of leaving regardless of how long you've been in here. Now, it turns out in system dynamics, this chance could change. And we'll see, see next lecture in a big way with, with, uh, with risk of infectious disease. This will be changing over time. But it's still what's invariant is the fact that no matter how long you spent in this stock, your chance is going to be that same value. It doesn't keep track of how long you've been there. It doesn't care when you arrive. Just you always have that the same chance. Um, that's what we call a memoryless assumption. It's memoryless. It doesn't care when you float in. These people are all viewed as interchangeable. They're all well mixed. They're all in a pool, an interchangeable resource pool, whatever. Um, okay. Um, by the way, some of you may be feeling cognitive dissonance about that because it takes some time to fill in. Because after all, I mean, didn't we see that curve coming down really quick before? What do you mean it doesn't matter how long you've been in there? Let me restate that for those who are who are thinking about this a little bit more deeply and are feeling puzzled. Because this this sticks in the craw of some people, um, as they might say it in Louisiana. Um, so so you're less likely to be in this state over time. The longer longer we consider the simulation running, it's less and less likely you're still in the state. But if you if you are still in the state, conditional on you being still in the state, you always have this 5% chance of leaving. It's just that most people have gone early on. The bigger this is, you normal. Early, early, early. But if you're still here, you always just have this 5% chance of leaving. For you. It's remember that. That remains constant. Your chance of leaving if you are still in the stock. Okay. 
So let's, let's, let's go four here. So we, we say this is memoryless. The problem is we know a lot of transitions are not memoryless. We know sometimes it does matter how long you've had it. So if, if you're considering something like flu, or you consider better yet a common cold, there are certain time constants associated with this. So within about two or three days of getting the infected, you're likely to start becoming infectious. About a day after that, maybe two, you're going to be starting to feel symptoms and feeling lousy. And then a couple days later, three or four days later, you're going, you're, if, if you have a very active immune system, a strong immune system, your cytotoxic T lymphocytes, other aspects of your immunity will be clearing up your the uh, infected cells and the, the virus particles will be in abatement and you'll lose your infectivity, etc. These things are not memoryless. It's not like you have a certain chance per unit time of recovering from flu. So so often we wanna we wanna represent the fact that we have these defined timelines. Mm -hmm. Um and uh you know, we want to capture the fact that there's sort of, it, it does matter how long you've been there. So how do we do that in system dynamics? How we do this in system dynamics and how we do this agent-based modeling are quite radically different. But the way in which we do it here is using a cascaded series of first order delays. And we call these, if you have K of them in a row, we call them a K order delay. So we string these things together. We build our model up out of these first order delays. And the behavior of a kth order delay, k of these in a row, is a reflective behavior of first order delays. Um, and to understand that behavior, we're going to consider, OK, suppose we have a, a system that's built out of one or two or three, respectively, number of first order delays in a row. In other words, the first order k equal one, k equal two, k equal three. And we're going to hold constant the mean time taken to transition across the entire set of all delays, the entire system how long it takes for you to go in and come out. It's just that you're going to pass through more of these stocks on the way. And we're going to consider that. Here's a simple first order delay. Um, and we, we've seen that. Um, and the this chance of leaving per unit time stays constant no matter how long you've been in, right? OK, so there's the first order delay behavior. Here's a second order delay. Now we have two stocks, OK? Um, and here we're going to still have a mean time to transition across all stages that's the same as the last one. Um, oh, did I not label that explicitly? Same as the last one, 50 time to go from here to here. But we're going to ask, OK, if we feed in an inflow, what do we see for the outflow? Um, we saw that here. Here's the outflow for a first order delay. We feed it. We actually, here we just started the first stop full and it drains down and this is our outflow from the whole system. Okay, um, here we're going to we're going to start with this full, stage one, and we're going to see okay how quickly people start coming out here, sort of the, the outflow there. And this is what we see. This is a second order flight. Initially no one's coming out here. Why is that? Why is initially no one coming out of the stage two outflow? Oh. Why is it no one's coming out here? Everyone starts here initially, and this starts zero. Why is it that immediately people don't start coming out here? Because they have to do what first? Yeah, they have to go, go from here to here, and then chances are they're not going to instantly go over there. It's going to take some time to go here, and then some time to go there. So we're going to have a trans we're going to have an outflow like this. A third order delay, we're going to see an outflow like that. Now we actually have a bit of a so th this last one, a second order delay, kind of started rising very sharply in the outflow. And the third order delay, it actually starts more gradual and then rises gradually and then sort of peaks. And you'll notice this peak. Where was the peak for the first order delay? Riddle me that. Where was the peak for the first order delay? This peak is out, is out here. Okay? This peak is looking... Uh, we have a, a mean time of 50 to go across the entire entire system, 50, um, in all of these. The peak of this, the peak of the outflow is at about 13. Where was the peak for the first order delay? The 
sorry? It's the initial time. Sometimes that seems really, you don't, you definitely don't want that. You, you know, um, uh, that you start in there, you're, you're most likely, you know, the, the, the value, of time at which the most people are leaving is, is instantly. So you go into university and the time, imagine you represented people in university there and, and people, suppose they, they were to come into the university and the peak time of, at which they leave is instantly. No, you don't want that. Uh, you don't want that. You want a delay like uh, like this. So, so here's a second order delay. Its peak is around 10. This peak is around 50, is around 13 or so on. And you can you can map out different order delays. This is the first order. Successive order delays start to get sort of successively larger amounts of time and then rises and in fact they're sharper. Let me ask this. Suppose I were to take this to the nth degree. Suppose I were to create a hundredth order delay or two hundred order delay or a thousand order delay. In the limit, what is this what does this start to become? In the limit, what does this start to look like? Here, remember, we're starting with the first stop in that fold. What is this? What will this start to look like in the in the extreme limit, where we have n you know, kth order delays as k goes to infinity? What it'll actually look like is if we have a mean time to transition, say of of uh, say of thirty. Basically, nothing will happen until that, and then suddenly everyone will leave at 30. Yeah. That's called an infinite order delay. It's a fixed time delay. It's a timeout where everyone leaves after after exactly uh, that amount of time. These are getting sharper. They're starting to come closer to that. It's getting more and more peaked, but it's um, it isn't yet um, it isn't yet to that uh, to that point. Okay, so this is a an infinite order delay. Yeah. Your manifest, I'm just trying to understand what situation could possibly cause something everybody just to power through that system. Oh, okay. Or like perhaps I just don't understand this. Oh, okay, so you're saying like this this sort of situation? Oh, you were saying like uh, if you have an infinite order delay yeah. in the system, yeah. um, at one point you just spike up and go straight back That's down. right. That's right. Why is that? Okay. So if you have a whole set of these in a row, so you have something along these lines, um, basically you consider you consider sort of uh, individuals transitioning between these, right? Um, if you have a k number of k as k goes to infinity, the probability that you've transitioned across each and all of these stages. Let's suppose the mean time to transition across each stage is, you know, one over k or something like that. Mean time, right? So there's, um, uh, excuse me, uh, yes, one over k. So the total, the total time across all stages is one. We'll just say without loss of generality, sort of treating it as unity. Um, okay, so this is the mean time uh, to transition across any one of those uh, stages. Now. They're going to be spending, on average, 1 over k time within this one, and on average, 1 over k time, 1 over k time, on average, 1 over k time. And they may go through some quicker, but be, be some slower. And you're going to get out something where, essentially, it's vanishingly unlikely that they'll come out before a certain time. And, and it becomes extremely likely that uh, they will come out Right at the um, uh, right at some some fixed time, and uh, the way it sort of all adds up, it's an aspect of what's called the central limit theorem. Also, I mean, it's related. I should say it's related to central limit theorem in log, log, no, large numbers. Um, but uh, fundamentally, what's going on here is that you know, as k goes to infinity, um, we are. Uh, we are having a, a small
smaller and smaller sort of number of amount of time spent in each stage, but the number of stages is going up. And you're going to get out something where um, in the limit it goes to sort of a precise time coming out. But that takes a lot of stages, um, a lot of stages. So you can experiment with it some, you know, do a 10th order delay, 15th order delay, et cetera. Um, oh, look at that. I said normal distribution. The normal distribution will have smaller and smaller variants, I believe. That's right. Um, so uh, you can, yeah, I'm going to have to think about that, but, but I believe that's, uh, that's correct. Okay. Um, so, um, right. Uh, so, yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. So the, the idea here is we can, if we want to capture a slow development process, let's suppose we have stages of cancer, or suppose we have stages of, of diabetes, or chronic kidney disease, and we don't want people, as soon as they enter diabetes, they're going to be developing um, uh, severe complications. Or as soon as they develop chronic kidney disease, they're not going to be getting end-stage renal disease. Then we will have many stages, and each stage will have a time constant associated with it, and we'll end up smoothing out, um, smoothing out the uh, sort of the the transition rate, uh, the, the flow, so that people are not instantly developing end-stage renal disease as soon as they're getting uh, chronic kidney disease. Instead, they're developing end-stage renal disease only after some characteristic amount of time. So um, another common use of these sort of systems is to represent what's called, age, you know, they're, they, they're used as what's called aging chains. So this might be children. This might be middle-aged individuals, and this might be the elderly. And you'll have you know, some time constant associated with each. Maybe for children, you'd have you know, this being 0 to age 15 on average. And so you'll have uh, a transition out where the, the mean time in this state is 15 years. And then what would the formula for this outflow, just as a sanity check here, and we'll stop here. What would the formula for this uh, this outflow be then? If we had 15 years here on average, what's the formula for that? For this outflow? Let's flip it around. If you have, if you have a stock, a simple first order delay, and you have a certain chance per unit time of leaving, say 5% chance per unit time, 0.05, what's your mean time in that stock? actually a mean time, which is exactly the thing I wanted to, to demonstrate. If, if we had this phrase as a chance per unit time of leaving, and this was the stock, the formula for this would be this times that chance per unit time of leaving. Good. But if this is, we could equally well express this formula as this stock divided by the mean time in that stock. Because after all, it's just divided by 1 over this thing is, you know. So, Stock times alpha 
Mathematically, that is identical to the stock divided by 1 over alpha. Right? And 1 over alpha is the mean time that you're spending in that stock. So you can express that formula here as either you have your pick as the stock times some chance per unit time of leaving, or mathematically completely identical with the first order delay, the stock divided by the mean time that you're in that stock because the mean time in that stock is simply one over the chance of leaving per unit time. Does that make sense? So, I mean, it's just two sides of the same coin. It's, it, it comes out of the fact, it reflects the fact, it's derivative from the fact, it is entailed by the fact that the chance per unit time of leaving is one over the mean time with the first order of delay and vice versa. So you, you have your choice about how to phrase this, this sort of thing. And so if we had a population divided into children, say people zero to 15 years of age, and we had a transition from that stock to middle aged, it's very common that you would have the, the rate of flow for that transition to be number of children over the number of years in that child stock, which is 15. Does that make sense? Okay. And similarly for middle aged people, you don't need you'd have a transition out to be divided by 40 years. You just have to realize that when it's a first order transition, this is what you get out. You get if there's people in there, they start to come out immediately. Immediately they start to go out. So if you have a bunch of children who start there, you know, zero to fifteen immediately some of them will be coming out and becoming adults. And that number start coming out per unit time will be greatest early on. And then it will be dropping. So there will be a lot of them becoming adults quickly, essentially. Whereas if you divide it into, you know, ages 0 to 5, or 0 to 4, 5 to 9, 10 to 14, then you would start to see them instead coming out like like, if they started in the 0 to 5, they'd start to come out of the, uh, the older category like that in a more peaked way. So the more detail you put in, the more precise sort of the timing of those transitions associated with aging, associated with maturation. And the closer we can get it to approximate a, a sort of a tight uh, fixed time to leave. Anyway, so um, that's my lecture on stock of flows. Now next time, what we're going to be going on to is um, the applications of some of these ideas to analysis of a nonlinear system, a system that exhibits much more interesting behavior. But these intuitions you've developed here, intuitions about stocks, flows, stasis, balancing loops, reinforcing loops, will become key to understanding this, most, this, this alternate behavior. And the behavior we'll be looking at will be very generic. We'll be talking about it specifically in terms of um, infectious disease and its spread. But the ideas there, the mathematics, um, the processes involved very well describe uh, the spread of memes, the spread of ideas, uh, uh, you know, political ideas or, uh, or uh, word of mouth about a product, etc. So the same model structure ends up being adopted, say, within marketing literature for the spread of, of news about a new product, about the iPhone 5 or what have you. And the same models that are used within the infectious disease area see, see their use in spread of networking messages within computer systems, see, see their use within spread of ideas, of, of, of uh, uh, promotional materials, etc. So. Um, tomorrow, or um, our next lecture, where I'll be here, which is on Tuesday, uh, we'll be talking about that. Thursday, again, um, those are in the class, uh, please come, because uh, Cheryl Waldner will be talking about this product, the project, which uh, uh, is associated with a very interesting model. And um, we'll have a presentation by Riley, and there may be a presentation by someone else as well who's interested in lead leading a project for the course, someone from that that. So, um, but I will see you in person um, here uh, next Tuesday. Be sure to, to come if you are registered for the class so we have a decent audience for these guests. Thanks very much.